From Idaho's News Channel 7, this is Viewpoint. Well, good morning and thank you so much for joining us here inside the KTVB studios for this Sunday morning's edition of Viewpoint. I'm your host, Joe Paris. Of course, we got a lot to get into here this week, and I'll start with this. Perspective seems to be such a scene setter. It's something that we, we really could get perspective of the world around us. And just for example, think about what you have going on this weekend, the plans, the people you get to spend time with. It feels like a given, just getting to enjoy Boise State football games, exploring Idaho towns, Perfect fall weather, too, as of late. But two years ago, the perspective, it looked pretty bleak. And almost exactly two years ago, Idaho was in the thick of crisis standards of care. The COVID pandemic overwhelmed our health system to the point that it kicked off a very real process of medical staff, equipment, and hospital beds being rationed for those who were most likely to survive. It was a grim outlook. You remember some of these graphs? Well, we tracked them daily, sometimes hourly. And this is a look at all of the Idaho patients that were hospitalized on a daily basis. And you see that huge spike in the middle of your screen? Well, that was two years ago this week. Time flies, or maybe it does. It depends on your perspective. So when we talk about the weekend plans, though, at that time two years ago, it was very different. And something that hasn't really changed, though, is the battle against misinformation surrounding COVID and vaccines and conspiracies, all of it got to the point where the state's top medical officials were speaking out about the misinformation. So I just wanted to take a look back to what Dave Jepson, director of Idaho Department of Health and Welfare, what he was saying about the harm of misinformation two years ago this week. Directly is causing real people to have real suffering and is directly leading to people being sick and in the hospital and even dying when they don't, don't necessarily need to. Uh, and so we appreciate the help from all of uh, the people watching and uh, all of those out in the public to be part of the solution to making sure that they share um, reputable information, accurate information to really combat the amount of misinformation and disinformation that's out there. Yeah, it brings us back to a very different time, or maybe not so different if you look at the conspiracy theories online, but it was a time that we checked in with Idaho, Idaho medical experts on a daily basis for crucial, crucial information. And I actually want to go back to that time in a familiar face throughout the pandemic. A lot of you people got to know him, the retired president and CEO of the St. Luke's Health System, Dr. David Pate. And Dr. Pate, as you know, a member of Governor Little's coronavirus working group and a doctor of internal medicine. That really doesn't really sum it all up, though. You recently published a book with Dr. Epperly that we'll get to in a little bit. But for, for starters, how are you doing these days? Uh, better than then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know that, you know, the, the thick of the pandemic, a lot of people will say that, that we've cleared through it. But I imagine the work for you is probably still very, very oh, yeah. ongoing. Very much, because now the difference is back then, really, really worried about all the people going in the hospital and dying now worrying about the long-term effects of COVID. And we'll talk about long COVID coming up in a little bit, but when you, when you think back to two years ago and we were both looking at that, that chart and the comment from Dave Jepson, what do you think about when, when you, you know, go back in the memory lane? What I think about is that people didn't really understand how bad it was and because we've never seen that before. And uh, that was the first time in Idaho's history we had to implement crisis standards of care. What you're talking about is people coming in very, very sick and some having to perhaps figure out how can we take care of them at home when normally we'd have them in the hospital and others, how do we treat them when we can't give them the full care that we normally would. Maybe they would normally be in the ICU, but we don't have ICU beds. They have to be on a regular floor. Maybe they'd normally be on monitoring, but we don't have enough monitors. Uh, it was really touch and go. And the burden on our staff, the burden on patients, it was just, it was really horrendous if you knew what was going on behind the scenes. Because I talked to, uh, I guess, medical professionals that are either hiring or working to hire younger folks to be nurses, doctors, <coughs> all kinds of staff, and they don't have that perspective of some of their no. colleagues of what they worked through. When you talk about the urgency, at the beginning, it seemed like the urgency was really there. Mm -hmm. Two years into the pandemic, looking back two years now, I mean, what would you say our response was? Uh, you know, I think initially the response was very, very good, as you said. I think what happened then is that uh, there was a lot of misinformation that this was just going to go away by the fall. And I think part of that led to schools not taking that summer to prepare. How do we get ready for for school. And so we had a lot of problems uh, when school uh, resumed. And then I think the other was just 
people spreading disinformation, like you said, that you don't need to worry about this. Uh, we've got effective treatments if you do get sick. Don't take the vaccines. Those will kill you or cause cancer or whatever the thing was. And what was really hard on top of all those other things I said was for the medical teams to see people coming in critically ill, shocked that the treatment they were given didn't work when we were not, we were telling them that's not good information and that they hadn't gotten vaccinated. More than 90% of the people in our intensive care units were all people that chose not to get vaccinated. And unfortunately, it wasn't an educated decision. They were duped. And I know that um, socially there's been a question out there, you know, because you talk about the COVID mitigation efforts we went through across the country here. You can talk about locally as well. At some point, it just stopped. Did it seem like from a medical perspective that socially the American public just gave up? Oh, yes. Yes. I think they became complacent. And I think that those of us that were trying to speak up about why we're not talking about living your life in a bubble, but why you want to take some precautions not to get infected, some of the things that might happen, you would just be labeled as fear mongering. So it really shut down a lot of that conversation to educate people about uh, that you don't want to get infected. And in fact, some of the disinformation was that getting infected was going to boost your immune system. Yeah. And that was crazy. <laughs> that was crazy. I remember people were comparing it to the chicken pox party. Yeah. It's like, oh, you want to get it. And remember the advice for yes. people like you, you don't want to get this. No. Um, of course, we talked about we were really in the thick of it two years ago this week. When you think about where we are now, though, I, I guess we know COVID's still with us. And I know just in my life, once in a while, someone will say, hey, I can't come to this event. Right. I tested positive for COVID. Right. What does it look like these days? I know that we just don't talk about it. Well, what it does look like now is that people are not getting as severely ill. And that's because most people have either been vaccinated, infected, or both. So that's what we're dealing with. But we're still dealing with people getting very sick, and we're still dealing with the people at either extremes of age not having immunity or having waning immunity, and those are the people going in the hospital still more deaths than we would normally have, and that's a tragic loss. But my worries today are more about what's the consequence to youngsters like you who get two infections, three infections, four infections, because I do think there's concerns that things that we don't know about what are the health consequences down the road. And something that caught my eye this week, and you mentioned this, is the federal government announced basically that families can start ordering and getting the free COVID tests again. Yes. And I'm curious, at this point in the pandemic or in this point in whatever you want to call it, because what's the value of testing? Is it as simple as it's just good to know if I have it or not? Because it's, they're not being reported. Right. So the benefits of testing are, number one, I hope that we've learned if you're sick, please stay home. Please don't share. Uh, and so one thing is don't, if you're sick, stay home and then test. Because if you have COVID, one, don't go and expose others. But two, we have options today. We have antivirals that we can use, especially for those that might be at risk of getting more severe illness. Coming up in our second segment, we're going to talk about boosters and vaccines and all of that. But uh, before we get to our break here in just a few minutes, I, I wanted to ask you about misinformation because we heard from Dave Jepson at the beginning of this segment here. And um, when you think about what we're going through now, do you think the purveyors of misinformation in your experience have moved on to other topics? Or I guess it, it just doesn't seem to be as, as like a waterfall of misinformation like before. I think there's still a waterfall. I think there's a lot of people not listening to it as much as before. Hmm. Also, they have broadened their horizons. Now we're seeing some extension of some of these arguments to other uh, areas, and that's going to be very dangerous for us. Um, when we look out into, I guess, the long-term outlook, is there, I guess, a chance or maybe an idea that a COVID mutation could be like the Delta virus or the Omicron virus, where maybe COVID activity has been kind of low, below the radar, and all of a sudden, some type of mutation, we see a spike like we did a few years ago. At this point, do we understand the mutations and if that's possible? We understand them better, but while most of us are not expecting a return to what we saw two years ago, it's not out of the question. And it's not out of the question for two reasons. One, infections that we have not protected immunocompromised people. We know that immunocompromised people can be infected with this virus for more than a couple years. And what that virus is doing in them, it's learning and it's changing. And then it can get reintroduced in the, the population. We think that's where 
Omicron came from. Hmm. And so that presents a risk. The other is we have let this spread into a large number of animals. And animals will have that virus mutate in different ways than humans do. And then it could come back into humans, as we've seen with mink. The final concern, the kind of the nightmare situation, and I don't mean to imply that this is likely or expected, but we can't rule out that that virus won't recombine with another and get those potentials to either spread m to much more people and overcome that uh, immunity or even cause more severe death. We just have to, we shouldn't be cavalier about it. We don't need to be panicked either. That was interesting because you and I were talking before the show. I joked with you, I said, when are you going to retire? Well, now when you start talking about stuff like this, you understand the scientific community, they've got a lot to dive we into. We have a lot to learn. Okay. Well, we are going to take a real quick break, but when we get back, we're going to talk about COVID boosters and what the value of them is right now. We're also going to talk about measles. Yes, there's a measles outbreak in Southwest Idaho that we need to talk about. Our guest, Dr. Pate, joins us after this break. Welcome back to Viewpoint, continuing our chat with Dr. David Pate. And uh, Dr. Pate, something I want to read you uh, that came out into my inbox. I think a lot of Idaho journalists got this this week. The Idaho Department of Health and Welfare put out a news piece this week. They're saying that additional measles have been reported in southwest Idaho. We'll show you the news release right there. They tell us that four people have been confirmed to have measles in Nampa, Idaho. All are children that were unvaccinated and exposed in a household of the initial measles patient. And that was announced by public health officials on September 20th. Um, is, is this surprising to hear or, or not really? I guess uh, at this point we know that vaccine rates in Idaho, they're, they're not at the top of the country's list. Right. So not totally surprising. And earlier this year, we had a huge outbreak in o Ohio. Mm -hmm. Measles is one of the most contagious viruses we know. If, if someone had measles and was in the room, left the room, we could still be exposed an hour to two hours later, even though that person's out of the room. It hangs in the air. And if you're unvaccinated and in that room, 90% of those people are gonna be infected. What the serious part of measles is, is for that initial case, I've, probably the father, th people at our age that get measles often get pneumonia mm -hmm. or something called encephalitis where your brain is inflamed and end up in the hospital. He was hospitalized, I don't know which he had, but that's serious. And then particularly very young children, under two, before they might be fully vaccinated, in their, when they're exposed, it can be very uh, severe. And what's tragic is there's a rare condition that can occur many years later after they've seemingly recurred and it's almost always fatal. There's a data point I came across actually this week, and it's that uh, the state of Idaho has notable vaccine exemptions and religious exemptions. And I think we actually have a graphic to put up here. You can see that Idaho actually leads the country in vaccine exemptions among kindergartners. You can see at 9.8%. So that means 9.8% of all the kindergartners in public schools appear to not have some of their vaccines. Um, it just, it, I know there's religious beliefs, there's philosophical beliefs. We could talk about that another time. But in terms of what this information means to the community, does that put Idaho at a significantly greater risk to have stuff like this, a measles outbreak. Absolutely. And and I don't think it's getting better with all the recent disinformation and distrust of the COVID vaccines. That's not helping our case anymore. So yes, it's a significant concern. And when we talk about, you know, getting vaccines, I know that the message here would be likely to go get your the MMR vaccine if you're a young child. That's right. Okay. That's right. So going back to COVID now, when you talk about boosters and vaccines, I know there was a time where the folks that were interested, they were rushing to get them. They were standing in line. They were calling, asking, when can I get it? At this point, when I hear, you know, talk out on the street about getting a COVID booster, it usually is the end of a joke. Right. What do you think people should know about getting a COVID booster heading into fall? I think you should know a couple things. Number one is that immunity does wane. Whether it was an infection or a vaccine, whatever, with time, it's going to wane. You're going to have less protection. Number two, it depends on what you're trying to prevent. A lot of people that are only arguing that seniors my age and above get vaccinated, what they're trying to prevent is severe illness, hospitalization, and death. If that's your target, that's right. Those people that are at highest risk should get the booster. My target is broader than that because we know that if you get vaccinated and boosted, your chances for long COVID uh, and other things decrease. And so I do think everybody should get boosted. Obviously, your choice. Talk to your doctor if you're not certain. But certainly, if you are old like me, 
get your booster. <laughs> Well, um, something I did also want to talk about, you and Dr. Ted Epperly wrote this fantastic book that you can see my bookmark, I've almost finished, and it's Preparing for the Next Global Outbreak, uh, a guide and some recommendations on what we should have done, likely, in the COVID pandemic. Um, there's a ton of great stuff in here. I'm curious, though, do you ever just sit there at night and think, oh, I should have put that in the book? Yes, I, I think about, you know, fortunately, not too many, though. I think we amazingly graft a lot, but every now and then I'll have another thought, oh, I wish we'd have added this. Maybe we'll have to do an update version one day. Yeah, well, <laughs> unfortunately, I'm sure there'll be time for that. Um, I was speaking uh, with, with uh, one of our colleagues at Boise State in the, in the medical science community, and um, we were kind of just talking about the idea that, like, COVID could have been this, this, this point where a lot of people could have really invested into learning about science and learning yes. about contagious diseases. Now that we can kind of take a step back from that, what do you think the ongoing impact of the pandemic is on public health discussions now? Unfortunately, it, this, and we never foresaw this, this one became so politicized mm -hmm. that, I, you know, I'm shocked that whatever you think about COVID, uh, not a big deal or not or whatever, but it should have been, as you said, our opportunity to talk about, well, how do we get prepared for something that could be more serious? I can list you a name, a list of 12 names of viruses that would have 40 to 80% mortality rates. That will get people's attention if that happens. And we don't need to panic, but why don't we prepare? And we learned so many lessons. So whatever you think about COVID, why aren't we talking about what are we gonna do about supply chains? How are we gonna make sure we have enough PPE if something happens in the future? How are we going to make sure that we have the drugs we need? You, you probably remember those early the years of this pandemic. There was a lot of drug shortages. We didn't have everything we needed. How would we get ventilators if we needed? And one last thing, Joe. We expanded cap hospital capacity tremendously back two years ago, as you were saying, for this September blip, to expand. We used teaching rooms for adult patients and all. What if we had a disease that was predominantly affecting children? Mm -hmm. That's my nightmare situation. We can't expand like we did for adults. You can't treat kids like you do adults. We would be in a devastating situation and we're not preparing. At this point, I guess when you talk about preparing, you know, what does that look like inside the medical community in terms of research and actual action? One is it means we need to stop ignoring illnesses that occur in other parts of the world. During COVID, we saw another, um, you could call it pandemic, it wasn't declared that, but we saw another one arise, monkeypox. Mm. Never expected monkeypox to, to pop up like this, but we've known about mon monkeypox. It was a disease that we typically only saw in Africa. Nipah, we're, we're seeing outbreaks. We typically only see it in, in Africa, but now we're starting to see it other places. We need to take those illnesses serious, research them, develop vaccines, even though we think it's in a country that's not affecting us. We're so interconnected, we can't dismiss these anymore. I was also was going to ask, because in this global economy, and yeah. sometimes it gets made, you know, in the Hollywood movies, it's like a pair here in this country ends up back in the United States. And it's yeah. like, but I know that that's Hollywood, but I mean, that also seems realistic. And that is what's happening. And we've seen that happen now. We've seen it with polio. Uh, the gentleman, the unfortunate case, the gentleman in New York who got uh, polio and is now paralyzed for the rest of his life, it was somebody that traveled internationally and brought it here. Uh, the measles case that we just talked about, that dad, he had traveled internationally. We're so connected, we can't rule these things out. As we start to wrap up this segment, we're going to have to have you back another time soon. we got a lot of recommendations to get through. But I'm curious, if I were to tell you two years ago in the real thick of it, okay, September whatever, 30th of 2023, here's what we're at, here's what the community levels look like, would you call what we're going through a success at this point, or would it just been a relief to be out of the thick of it? Well, it is a, a relief to some extent, but this represents a failure. Mm -hmm. uh, we had an opportunity to stop this virus way back in 2020. What we've learned is the world does not have the fortitude to do this. It would take some sacrifice, but we could have stopped this and be done with it. But we, we've got to have different approaches because we don't have the appetite to have our, our to make sacrifices very long. Well, Dr. Pate, we always appreciate your time here on KTVB. Again, preparing for the next global outbreak. Dr. Pate, Dr. Ted Epperly, of course, friend of the show here. Uh, well, Dr. Pate, thank you so much for your time as always, and we'll be chatting with you soon. And I know uh, we got your wife here hanging out with us today, and uh, my message is that I hope you do get to retire comfortably and not end up so on Channel 7 every week. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Joe. All right, Dr. Pate, thanks so much. We'll be right back after this. 
Welcome back to Viewpoint. Uh, many in our community continue to mourn the loss of a prominent leader in Idaho's Latino community, J.J. Saldana. J.J. was a local advocate and Latino community leader here in Idaho, and we learned about his passing this week. J.J. was involved with so many groups across Idaho, and he was a part of the Idaho Commission on Hispanic Affairs. He co-founded the Idaho Hispanic Youth Leadership Summit, and he was also a founding advisory council member to VOSSES, the internship of Idaho, as well as known for uplifting Idaho's youth and making sure that Latinos were represented in Idaho's media, including places like KTVB. And this week, our Jude Binkley spoke to the people JJ lifted up in our community, a memorable man with a lasting impact. When we remember him, I, I want to remember somebody who is funny, who is kind, who is giving, who is smart, um, you know, and somebody who was a relentless advocate for the community because he was all of those things. Rebecca De Leon co-hosted the Latino Card podcast alongside JJ Saldana and both served on the VOSA's Internship of Idaho Advisory Council. And he was so truly about lifting other people up. He was the most selfless person I have ever met. The two met 10 years ago after Rebecca graduated college with a degree in journalism. He did everything that he could do to make sure that I, I succeeded. They worked together to bring better representation to Latinos in Idaho media. He was so adamant and would not stop, like was relentlessly saying, this is important and we need to change this. We need to change the landscape. Newsrooms need to change from the inside. The, the community needs to be more empowering to young Latino people who want to be journalists. Rebecca describes JJ as someone who never stopped giving to the community. He was all about better representation. He was about empowering the youth, empowering Latinos to, you know, to have big opportunities to succeed for themselves and to really showcase what our community could do. In a statement, the Idaho Hispanic Chamber of Commerce called JJ a tireless advocate for the Hispanic and Latino community, saying his impact reached far beyond the state house and college walls and into the hearts of those he served. He was a hope for for kids who wanted to, you know, be, you know, what their their parents sacrificed to come to this country for. They wanted to be that. They would look to JJ and they would see that he was not just successful, but that he was accessible, that he was warm and friendly and and wanting them to succeed. Rebecca says JJ will leave a hole in the community that can never be filled although they will try. I think the best way to, to honor his memory will be to continue the work that he was so passionate about. Um, and the best thing that we can do is to continue his example of really truly having our feet firmly planted in community. Um, because that's what, that's what he did, that's what he wanted. Um, and that's, that would be the best way to honor him. Carrying on JJ's he was, legacy. He was incredible. He was my best friend. And the entire KTVB family extends their condolences and thoughts to J.J. Saldana's family and the community. And it really is hard to put into words just the impact that he had on not just the Latino community, but the community across the Treasure Valley. We saw so many uh, messages and thoughts this week and stories. So uh, again, we just wanted to share our condolences there. Well, I do want to say that we are entering election season now, and for all of your election coverage as we preview things like the Boise mayoral race, you can take a look right now at KTBB.com. we got a lot of interesting stuff going on there. But for now, we are going to say goodbye. Thank you so much for joining us this week on Viewpoint. Again, thank you to our guest, Dr. David Pate. We'll see you next week, Sunday morning.